Welcome to Experience 50, episode 136. Hey, it's Experience 50, where we are honestly middle-aged. That's right. And we're going into the holidays. We're really in the thick of it right now. And in our last episode, I spoke with Kim Aceto, who did a great job telling us to be, you know, just kind of take it easy on ourselves, slow down, enjoy those, you know, those small moments during the holidays. And uh, as she said, eat that cookie. So uh, I want to take this another step further. I'm going to talk to you today about the three ways to ruin Christmas. And it could be whatever holiday you may be celebrating, but Christmas is just loaded with opportunities for hurt feelings and misunderstandings, and it's really easy to screw this up when you're in your 50s because, you know, our our kids are not under our control anymore. We have a lot more factors that the adult kids now have their own idea of how they're going to spend the holiday. They may have significant others, and those people have parents who have their own ideas. We also have our parents who may not be able to travel the way that they used to, and so we have a lot of feelings about our own responsibilities and and commitments to making sure that our parents still have a Christmas that resembles, at least in some way, the Christmas that they created for us. So again, super, super easy to screw this up. And the way I see it, the three ways that you can really ruin Christmas is number one, have expectations that may not be realistic or may not match with other people's expectations for the holiday. Number two, stubbornness. Just digging your heels in that the traditions that have stood will remain. And third, just having a lack of imagination for how holidays can look today. So, What I'm going to do is I do want to share part of an episode from, gosh, three years ago when we talked with Diane Wingert about having, well, how to deal with our adult children at the holidays. And a lot of what she says still applies even in dealing with our parents and and our spouses and other people. It, It, again, gets down to these three things, expectations, stubbornness. And I'm throwing in this year having a lack of imagination. Because I think, and I'll start with that, the lack of imagination. As we are in our 50s and all of our relations are are very fluid, things are changing, and we're, we're getting used to what might be a new normal, but it might be just, what does this year look like? It doesn't mean we're establishing a tradition going forward, I think we have to look at things now more as a, okay, what's the 2018 version of Christmas going to look like? And I don't want you to get so stuck in your expectations and your stubbornness that all you focus on is, okay, well, how can I, how can I take these different little pieces and, and conditions that are in front of me and make it look as much like the Christmas I want as possible? Because sometimes you, it's just like putting a square, you know, peg in a round hole. It isn't going to work. So sometimes you need to have a, a brand new clean slate and bring your imagination to it and be creative. And and maybe it is. Christmas isn't just a 24-hour period. Maybe Christmas extends over three weeks. And over those three weeks, you find that you have an opportunity to spend time with the people that you want to see, do things you want to do, and it all will happen and it'll all be part of the same season, but it doesn't have to happen within those 
24 hours or 48 hours of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Also, consider that some of these traditions that you may want to continue, you can still do them either alone or with different people or just you and your significant other, that just because your kids aren't with you or your parents are not going to be with you or you have different new people with you, it doesn't ruin the tradition of it just because you're sharing it with different people or solo. If it's if it's your heart that wants to experience that, um, you know, cutting down a fresh Christmas tree or decorating the cookies with Frank Sinatra Christmas music on, you can still do that and just give everyone a break that they're not in your kitchen doing it with you. Are you with me? There is also an opportunity around the holidays to if things get too crazy, if they're too far away, you know, if if it's going to be just too inconvenient to try to smush everything in and and because people are in different cities, different countries, um, you know, the combinations of people just become convoluted and weird. There is always the option of opting out of you deciding you are traveling and maybe you and a a single friend or you and your spouse, you're going to go on a trip. It's still not too late. Believe me, you can get awesome last minute deals on Christmas travel. And sometimes you just need to step away from the traditional ideas, use some imagination and buy an airline ticket and go. Or, and I'm just, I'm going to throw out a bunch of different ideas because I've done most of these or I've heard of people who have. You could host a Christmas dinner at your own home and just invite, you know, kind of like the Island of Misfit Toys from Rudolph the the Red-Nosed Reindeer, one of my very favorite Christmas shows. And Invite people who don't have anything else to do for the holiday. You know, instead of traveling across the country to go to some kids, you know, in-laws holiday, create something completely new, something completely different. So, uh, and speaking of travel, I, this is really funny. There, there's this theme of stories that I have heard from other people, and I knew exactly what they were talking about, because we had the same thing happen to us. My husband and I were talking with another couple, and and we we were discussing just some of the crazy nonsense that happens around the holidays, especially when you travel somewhere else to be with someone else's, you know, family in their orbit of Holly. And what happens sometimes is that you're involved in someone else's Christmas. And maybe you've been invited to come to the house and celebrate, you know, the opening of the gifts in the morning with little kids around, which is awesome. And then there's a meal. And then you're getting the signals that it's time for you to leave now. And it might be like one o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon, or six o'clock, whatever. And you realize you're going back to a hotel and you, you know, if it's one o'clock in the afternoon, what the heck are you supposed to do? Everything is closed. And so when my husband and I were talking with a couple, they were sharing their, their horror story of Christmas, including the fact that they ended up on Christmas for Christmas dinner, standing in a nasty Chinese restaurant, getting carry out. And my husband and I just looked at each other and laughed because we've been there. We have been there. And it it was exactly the same thing. We were out of town. Someone else was hosting and they kind of gave us the heave ho at like two o'clock in the afternoon. And I am really 
sorry to say that my family did not rise to the occasion. <laughs> we were, we, we, it was, we adopted just this terrible mindset. And we were kind of furious and kind of livid and our feelings were hurt. I'll talk about that with Diane in just a minute about hurt feelings. But, you know, looking back on this, and it's been eight, 10 years since this happened. And there were enough of us that got the heave ho. We should have been able to turn that around into well, this is weird and fun, and we're eating Chinese food, and we're in a hotel room now. But I so regret now that we all just wrapped ourselves up in a blanket of piss. <laughs> and I, as the mom in the group, I especially feel bad about this because I think I was the one who should have been, you know, the cheerleader of, hey, this is okay. This is okay. We've got our egg foo young. We have our lo mein. We have our fortune cookies. And let's play charades. Or let's find a great Christmas movie on TV or something. But instead, eh, yeah, that was a total, total Christmas fail should have been more flexible, totally ruined um, our day because of expectations. We assumed and expected that Chris, you know, a Christmas invitation was for the entire day and, you know, into the evening. That was a question I never asked the hostess and we never talked about it. They clearly had their expectation that we were going to be there, you know, for a little part of the day. We had our expectation that we were spending the entire day. And so that's where things got screwed up. A, we should have checked, you know, ahead of time, should have had better communications and shouldn't have been so stubborn about this is not what Christmas looks like. How how in the world did we end up eating Chinese food for dinner on Christmas? I was stubborn. I admit, we all were. So... Oh, one other story before we go to Diane. So over Thanksgiving, I had mentioned in the last episode that my husband and daughter and I went to Charleston for Thanksgiving. And we were staying in a hotel, which was lovely. And after, oh, it was in the evening and we were coming back to our room. So we're in the elevator being quiet and there's a couple with, you know, they're a middle-aged dish couple and they have their probably 12 year old daughter with them. And we're all kind of rubbing our bellies because we've all just eaten Thanksgiving dinner and oh my gosh, we're all so full. And the husband and the daughter were both just like, you could tell all they wanted to do was get back to the room and get in their jam jams and turn on the TV and be exhausted and rest as a family. And as soon as, I think it was the husband, no, the daughter said, oh, all I want to do is get in my pajamas. <laughs> They're the thin-lipped mother said, oh, no, we're going upstairs and changing our clothes and going on a walk. And my husband and I looked at each other in the elevator. And we were both just like, our hearts went out to that kid. It was like, oh, drag, mom's going to make you go on a walk. And you know what? To that mom, dang, you ruined it. You could have had this really nice end to your holiday day with your husband and your daughter. And instead, you were going to force this, you know, thing on them that no one wanted to do. And frankly, she just had unrealistic (laughs) expectations. She was being stubborn. And she had a lack of imagination for how much fun it could be for the whole family to get in their pajamas, lay on their hotel beds, and watch a movie. So, okay, now it's time for us to go to Diane Wingert. Again, we recorded this like three years ago, 
And we're talking about, you know, dealing with the whole issue of adult kids and our expectations during the holidays. So I hope you enjoy this and uh, just enjoy the holiday, guys. Oh, I love Christmas. All right, here's Diane. Do you know what I'm talking about? That it, it's like in our fifties. We well, when we were younger with little kids, we were totally in control of our holiday, pretty much. And now with older kids, adults, we kind of lose control of all of that. I feel the pain. I'm experiencing this in my own life. I'm hearing about it with my therapy and coaching clients. And even this morning, I heard a similar story from my dentist while having him work on one of my teeth. It just seems like so many people's feelings get hurt. And I <laughs> I hate that expression. Oh, my feelings are hurt. Or, oh my gosh, so-and-so's feelings are going to be so hurt. I don't, I, I guess it just can't be avoided. Tell us what your advice is. You know, Mary, I think when people say their feelings are hurt or they anticipate hurting someone else's feelings, it really comes down to a gap between what we expect and what we get. Where do those expectations come from? Well, they come from the fact that until our kids grew up and started dating people and getting married and adding other family members to their lives from their partner's side, we usually could expect that they would be with us for all the major holidays and perhaps the minor ones, depending on the family and where everybody is situated. You really didn't have to plan things so far ahead. It was just sort of understood. And a lot of those family rules kind of became unspoken over time. And we just thought, well, they're always home for Easter. They're always home for Christmas. They're always home for Thanksgiving. And we're going to have our traditional meal. We're going to have our traditional rituals, whatever they may be. And it's an unspoken, just part of being in this family. Once the kids grow up and start getting involved with other relationships, or even before they're involved with other relationships, I've seen this with a lot of families where the parents ship their kids off to the first year of college. And they just assume that they're going to want to come home at every college break. And sometimes they're really shocked when Thanksgiving break rolls around and their child tells them, don't send me a plane ticket. I'm going skiing with some of my frat buddies. And it may be the first time the parents ever realized, oh, I guess I can't really take these things for granted anymore. And it can be it can be shocking and feel hurtful. Well, and some parents in that case, or, or in any of these situations, will try to emotionally blackmail their children. Oh, yeah. Sometimes Absolutely. it works. <laughs> well, yes, not that I know appears, about these things. It may appear to work because we might get them there. Yeah. But what, what often happens is there there's a consequence to that. Because, of course, once your kids are adults... And, you know, the whole world is impressing that upon them. Well, you know, you're 18 now. That means you're an adult. Or, you know, they try to get their parent to make a doctor's appointment for them once they've gone to college. And they're told by the doctor's office, you're an adult now, so you need to make your own appointments. We really can't deal with your parents anymore. They start recognizing, oh, I guess I do have an opinion about things. I do have a vote. And maybe it is time for me to consider what I really want to do. And when that mindset gets shifted to the family traditions, parents oftentimes aren't prepared for the fact that there may need to start being some negotiation that we can't just sort of assume and take for granted that the kids are going to do what they've always done or that they're even going to want to. So I think if any of your listeners are finding themselves in that situation where maybe for the first time their kids are saying, hey, you know, I, I guess you were thinking I was going to come home, but I was thinking it might be more fun to go on a ski trip that um, to sort of be prepared for that and to realize this isn't about not valuing the family ties. This isn't about not loving the family traditions. This is about the newfound sense of freedom and the greater uh, degree of opportunity there is for young adults. 
Well, and don't you think it, when it there is, let's say that your your kids have gotten married or they're in a relationship, and the other mother, and this is usually mothers that are the ones that get upset about this. You know, it, you can decide. I'm going to be a good mother. I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be open minded about this. I I'm realistic. I understand. Then there's a a thought that if the other mother is not going to be that way. She's going to win every time. <laughs> Can you tell where I'm not? A <laughs> Do you know what I, I mean? It's like, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's kind of funny because how many times in our lives have we found ourselves in a situation where we think I'd really like to be the grown up here. I'd like to put on my big girl panties and take the high road and model for my children how to handle a potential conflict with another person with some dignity in class but then there's that feeling that, you know, if the other side's not going to play fair, all I'm going to have to comfort me is my moral high horse. I'm never going to get my way. Right. And, you know, you, oftentimes you kind of get dragged into the, you know, the dirty fighting um, and the, you know, the mudslinging and the guilt mongering and all that can go with it because you don't want to end up empty handed. And I've certainly seen this with a number of families where they may say philosophically, I don't want to play dirty, but if taking the high road means I'm never going to see my kids for Christmas because the family my son is married into is dominated by a woman who really doesn't care if the grandkids ever see their other set of grandparents, then I'm going to drop down into the mud pit and sling some myself. Well, and it's it's unfortunate. But the way I guess my approach at this point, my my son is 29. And so this year, for the first time, I won't see him for either holiday, not for Thanksgiving, not for Christmas. And last year was the first time that that sort of happened. And here's what I'm thinking is, when I get to see him, it's a bonus. But we have to be grown ups. And I think we're kind of shifting now to including more friends in our holidays than family. Does that? I mean, I, I, I think that's going to be our strategy. Because last year, we were very lonely. I think when you're in the because I do work a lot with people in some sort of transition, I think what makes it tough is the first year and sometimes the first two years, depending on how adaptable you are to changes in your circumstances. But to the degree to which you can anticipate that things are changing, you know, just kind of paying attention when your kids are old enough to date and old enough to marry if they seem to be getting serious and knowing a little bit about that other person's background and where are they from and you know just noting that if they start dating somebody or moving in with somebody or proposing to somebody who comes from another city state country continent that your traditions around the holidays and how they are observed within the family are going to be open for renegotiation and what you don't want, and it's harder for some people and easier for others, is to let go, choosing, voluntarily choosing to let go of the belief that things have to stay the way they were in order to have the same value and meaning. It simply isn't so. So if we're so committed to our belief that Christmas always has to be celebrated on Christmas Eve and certain people always have to be there and we have to use this special Christmas china and the tree has to be at least seven feet tall and all of these things have to have to have to happen. We're going to have a much harder time of adjusting when the family starts changing for a variety of reasons. It, you know, we're talking about the specific situation where the kids are old enough to date and marry and partner up and start spending more time with another family. But it can also happen through other means, you know, people that don't even have kids, sometimes they won't come to a Christmas gathering because they have an aging parent or an, even an aging pet. And they'll think, you know, I, I'd really like to be there. I've had this happen with one of my sons. He's missed more than one 
Thanksgiving and more than one Christmas gathering because he didn't feel that he had someone responsible enough to care for his dogs while he was gone for a few days. So I remember the first time it happened, I thought, if you really wanted to be here, you'd make those arrangements. But I realized that in thinking that, And that's an optional thought. I was choosing to think that, that I was really kind of putting my son in what I call a dysfunctional loyalty bind, where he was kind of being made to feel by the things I was saying that he had to choose between his loyalty to me and to the family and his loyalty to his pets, who are his children. And I realized, you know, that wasn't fair of me. And I might have won the battle by getting him to that particular holiday, but I was losing the war in terms of the damage being done to our relationship. So once I kind of recognized that, I thought, you know what? I just need to be more adaptable. I need to be more flexible. I need to be more creative. And I also need to recognize that Really important relationships are not going to fray and splinter and implode if we don't have them happen in the way that we've had them happen in the past. All relationships must change over time because our needs change, our abilities change, our limitations change. So we can sort of take the high road in that way and say, you know what? I mean, in fact, as I'm thinking about it now, Mary, for several years, while two of my kids were in college, they were both working part time and going to college full time. And the jobs that they had in a bookstore and in a restaurant meant that they were never going to be able to come home to Los Angeles for Christmas. They were going to need to work. So we, for several years, had Christmas in January. And what was really cool about that is once we all sort of got used to the idea that Christmas can be whenever we decide, whenever we can all be there and whenever we can all feel good about being there and the sacrifices we each needed to make to be there, we actually were able to start buying our Christmas presents at the after Christmas sales and we could give each other much more generous things. See, that's being very practical. I felt better, too. That was really the bottom line. I could have been hurt. I could have been angry. I could have put them in a dysfunctional loyalty bind and said, well, it's your family or your job, kiddo. You decide. But that's really not only not fair to the young adult, it's also not fair to ourselves as midlifers because we really owe it to ourselves to become more flexible, more creative, and more adaptive. We're certainly going to need more of that as we face the challenges ahead in our own lives. So it there's no time like the present to get started on that. And even though this may not have been what we chose in terms of needing to shift our family traditions, it's definitely doable. And you can even make it fun as long as you approach it with the right mindset. What I hear you saying is we really need to make a decision that I'm going to be okay with this and then make it that way. Even if it seems impossible, from the get-go, you need to decide, I'm going to figure out a way to make this okay. Right, because consider the alternative, Mary. The alternative is you really don't often have complete control over the situation. You have to exert all kinds of unhealthy and dysfunctional relationship patterns in order to try to exert control, like guilt, guilt manipulation and hysterics and all that. And even though you may get your way, You put so much pressure on the relationship and probably create a lot of tension and resentment for the other parties that it really doesn't bear well for the relationship over time. And when that no longer works, and let's say you've got an adult child who's married into another family that lives in another part of the country, they have just as much right to see their offspring as you do, and they also want to see their their life partner. So you kind of have to deal with this at some point. And rather than having it sort of forced upon you and being dragged into a new arrangement, kicking and screaming every step of the way, I just think it always feels better to say, okay, maybe this isn't what I had in mind. Maybe this isn't what I would have preferred, but I'm going to have a good outcome for all of us by making a decision to make the best of it. And so let's talk about some ways that you can make the best of it. So my one of my thoughts was to travel during the holidays someplace else. So it it doesn't feel like that empty chair is just staring at you, you know, or to arrange to go have your holiday 
at someone else's house. So it's not so glaringly different. I know a number of people who are midlifers who are either divorced or never married, and some of them have never had kids. And a number of them have told me they learned a number of years ago that the loneliest place to be when you're single is during the holidays. Mm -hmm. The loneliest time of year for singles or, or divorced or widowed people is during the holidays. So for the same reason why that's a lonely time of year for, for unattached people, it can be a lonely time of year when you're really missing one or more of your kids. And it's a great idea and highly adaptive to take yourself somewhere else where you don't have those associations. You know, if you decide I'm going to go to a ski resort or I'm going to go to Hawaii or I'm going to go anywhere other than where you've been in the past during the holidays, you're not going to be missing who isn't there. You're going to be having a totally different experience and creating different associations with the holiday. It's also great to invite friends over in place of family members who aren't there. And I remember a few years back, we had a lovely tradition of inviting people over to our house for Thanksgiving who were either new to the area or were recently divorced or had lost a loved one because we knew if we didn't have those people over, they probably weren't going to be observing the holiday at all. And we made it a potluck so nobody felt like there was any kind of charity or pity involved and everyone made a contribution. And those were some of the best holiday meals I had because it was, you know, you and I've talked about this a little bit off air that uh, there's the family that you're born into or create through adoption. And then there's the family that you give yourself through your affiliations, your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors, the people you actually pick to sit around the table with you. And what better time than a holiday when you might otherwise be feeling sorry for yourself because one or more of your loved ones is somewhere else. I love that idea. So let, let's all, you know, ev even if all of your loved ones are around the table, I still suggest what Diane said is to look for people who were divorced that year or who maybe their spouse passed away or, or they're just new to the area. What a nice thing to do to invite them to join you and not the day before Thanksgiving or the day before Christmas, but now. That's such a good point, Mary, because it's not just a matter of reaching out to those people, but doing so in a timely manner so they don't feel that you're just trying to fill an empty seat, that you actually handpicked them to join you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I know I am pledging to let go of some of my control freak behavior about the holiday because I'm terrible. I will just confess. I'm... It has to be the salt and pepper shaker, it, you know. <laughs> but I'll tell you why I do it, because it's like this whole story, but in reverse. I miss my parents terribly, mm. and they, they died when I was in my early 30s, late 20s. And so I have all of their stuff, and Christmas was a major occasion with my parents. And so I like bringing out I mean, I still have the the Christmas ornaments that were on my childhood tree. And so I recreate my memories with my family, with my parents, by recreating it and sharing it with my family and my friends. So... How lovely is that? And let me ask you, Mary, with all the tr deep traditions that you have and you were able to recreate, not only for yourself, but for everyone present, do you add any new traditions? Oh, maybe yeah. not, maybe oh, not yeah. every year. Do oh, you continue? Do, do you oh, buy yeah. new ornaments? Do you yeah. buy new decorations? I'm okay. not, I'm not that bad. <laughs> so but you, I'll tell you what, this was interesting because this year for Thanksgiving, we're going to go be with a family who are very dear to us, but we, we've we never done Thanksgiving with them before. So we're traveling to their home, and we were going to share the cooking. And I asked her what, you know, what traditions are must-haves for you and your family. And she told me, she said, ever since my mother died, my sister and I agreed the menu would never change. 
and her sister won't be with her this year. So we're replacing her loved one that's missing. And I guess I'm growing up because when she told me that, and her mom hasn't been gone for that long, I said, great, we will have your mother's menu. But I get it. I totally get the the miss the the parents that have passed keeping their tradition makes the makes my heart warmer you know hmm. well you jokingly referred to yourself as a control freak but i think yeah. there's a little there's a, and I, I can definitely raise my hand uh to that but you know i think we all have that to some degree in that when things are precious to us, when things are very dear to us, when they really, really warm our hearts, we don't ever want them to change. We don't want them to go away. We don't want those memories to tarnish. We want to be able to preserve them and cling to them. And there's nothing wrong with that, except some things are going to change no matter how hard we try for them not to. And the more we fight that, the more pain it causes us. Mm -hmm. So the degree to which we can kind of be alert to, okay, there's change in this area, but so maybe the people that you have around your table won't be exactly the same from year to year, but the meal can be and the tableware can be and the centerpiece can be. And so you've got both an evolving tradition and a very durable one. Can we still have cloth napkins? Oh, that's a must. That goes without <laughs> saying. No, 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 no. Because that, that's a non-negotiable. I agree. I absolutely agree. And and they have to have napkin rings too. Oh, now you got me there. I'm not a I'm not a napkin ringer mm. person, but cloth napkins. Yes, three hundred and sixty five days a year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that we have, you know, made people think a bit about how they're going to approach the holidays and. Perhaps it's a way of giving a gift to your older children to be more flexible and to actually discuss it with them that, you know, sure, you know, sure, I'm going to be sad that you won't be with me, but you're a grown man or a grown woman, and I know you will be happy doing what you're doing, and maybe next year we'll be together. Is Absolutely. It? Everybody feels so much better when it happens that way. And even if you have to paste a smile on your face and fight back tears the first couple of times you say it, it pays rich rewards in not only keeping the relationship between you and your adult children, you know, in healthy and flexible, but it also maybe forces you to adapt a little bit more to how life is constantly changing. And we do better when we change along with it. All right. I want to thank Diane Winger again um, for her advice. She's she's always so wise. And do remember to invite people to join you in Christmas, those who may have been widowed or divorced in the last year, people who are going to be alone. And it is so important that you invite them before the last minute. Let them have a good answer when people ask them, so what are you doing for Christmas? Um, those last minute invitations, though they're welcome, they just aren't wrapped in the same ribbon as a holiday invitation that comes in a more timely fashion. So have a great one. And again, thanks for listening. If you want to get on the mailing list, just jump over to the website, experience50.com. Love to you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.